I missed it. Yeah. I missed admit when we were doing when when we were organising the live show. Um, yeah. I, I did. I did a Google on you. Um, that's when I realised that you were just hitched and you know, yeah. So so how's how's married life? It's wonderful. Yeah, we're we're going to be having our first anniversary in lockdown, which is slightly weird. Mm-hmm. Um, we we got married in um, in Rome in last year, um, and so it was just it was perfect and amazing. And I mean, I feel very very grateful that we we did it when we did it. And it was, yeah, I feel really really terrible for people who've been planning their weddings and and having oh, to yeah. cancel uh, them or postpone them or whatever cousin of mine was due to get married oh. this weekend and oh, really? the the irony is as well that they cancelled it from last year as well oh no how he, come he's he's from nigeria and right. his paperwork didn't come through in time so oh, they had to cancel yeah. it last year and it was yeah this weekend oh no oh sorry about that noise is that neighbours with their garage is just opening up so Listen, that's just happening uh, fans of dumb this is the excitement uh, fans of dumb to dumb like noises off you know there's there's a <laughs> there's a little thread on one of our apps when people says what was the noise you spotted this week you brilliant know? yeah yeah brilliant. so so it adds to the authenticity of it so you're happily yeah. married yeah. And... happily married yeah it's wonderful yeah it's really wonderful so yeah and how long have you known each other We've known each other, yeah, uh, seven years now. Um, we met on Casualty, um, on an episode of Casualty in 2013, and uh, he's an actor, um, Martin Delaney. He's a brilliant actor, and he's been acting since forever. Um, since he was, I think, about 15, he um, went into the West End with Oliver and... Uh, yeah, and so we met doing that and had very different sort of entrances into the into the industry. So I went to drama school and he was always working. Yeah, yeah, together. yeah. We, yeah. We, we, we can talk about all that in a minute. But, know, like, but people lovely. want to know, was it love at first sight, though? Did you, you know, look at him across, you know, when he's had his casualty scrubs on, he went, aye, aye. <laughs> <laughs> we were both, we were, both um, we were guest, um, guesting in the episode. So we, um, we both had, he had a broken arm and I had a little head injury and we were playing... Um, we were playing opposite each other. It was our engagement party mm. at, on the show, which was weird. Um, and we we were both it, it, um, we were both just out of massive relationships, so we weren't really in a, a place where we could get together. But I think we were both we were pre- both pretty into each other. We were best friends for years before we got together, but we sort of didn't realise. It took us a long time to realise that we were together. Weirdly, but yeah, all well- good. Well, I suppose the obvious link now is to say that the character of, of Emma, she knows all about getting yeah. hitched, doesn't she? She's done it a few times yeah, now. For yeah, one, for one so her. young. Yeah, yeah. Bless her. But, she's a, mm-hmm. yeah, she's had a rocky old a rocky old time. But she's definitely blossoming, isn't she? She's becoming yeah. a, a strong, forceful character. Yeah. But before yeah. we do the whole kind of Emma thing. We have to mm. uh, ask you a little bit more about you because this okay. this thread is called My First Day on Set. Yeah. And it culminates with you arriving at the mailbox and uh, and you telling us all about that. But I suppose we need to start before then. And you you have the most beautiful name. So I'm presuming, oh, I'm guessing, putting two and two together, that you have an Irish family. Um, yes. So uh, tell us about your Irish family and and how an Irish family uh, could bring up a future star of the archers in Cambridge. <laughs> um, well, my my dad's side of the family are all quite. Um, we've got kind of a mixed mixed heritage, which is mm-hmm. really beautiful. With um, my dad's my dad's side of the of the family are all classical musicians, and his father and further back were. Um, Russian Jewish immigrants, mm-hmm. um, refugees, and uh, what sort of saved them was music and coming to the country to form an orchestra. Um, and my grandfather, we called Papa Teddy, uh, was um, 
his father, Papa, was one of the first people to work for the BBC. Um, he was a violinist, and uh, approximately my... what year are we talking here? So this was this was when it first started. So this would have been what the oh, when did the BBC start? This was early twenties, about twenty three or so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, around that time because Papa Teddy was born in twenty one, I think, and um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, he was offered a contract like an, to be an employee of the BBC and he turned it down because he thought it was a flash in the pan, <laughs> which um, was really him all up with business decisions. He always took the wrong course. Um, and that's my great grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, and my grandfather played, uh, he was um, a first violinist in um, the BBC orchestra for a long time and he did uh, the proms and so the BBC was always very much part of our lives in the family um, and really kept my family going the musician side of the family um, and then it's sort of gone down through the through the generations my brother's a brilliant pianist and mm -hmm. um, my aunt is um, she was in the dolly mixtures and she's a she was a, a pop musician as well as a brilliant cellist and singer um, and then I sort of went a bit rogue and decided to go into acting um, but voice and audio has always been um, my kind of cornerstone, really. So, so that's where it's kind of come out for me. And my mum, my mum's side of the family rule. My mum was an artist. Um, my dad was a was a punk drummer and uh, and beautiful pianist, and ended up being a music therapist, which mm. was the kind of perfect mix of all his talents. So we're all quite kind of, I guess, creative and. Um, uh, unconventional it would have been it would have been a much bigger shock if i'd have told them that i was going to go into banking you know <laughs> that's really our lot it's my cousins and stuff are all in that and they're all very clever but we're much more um i guess arty i don't know <laughs> um, yeah. so at what age did you uh, decide well i need to stay in this whole kind of sphere of creativity and and acting is going to be the thing for you i I don't remember making a decision about being an actor, but um, mm -hmm. but I always knew that was my path. And um, the family story is that I was three and my dad took me to the pantomime and, uh, and Humpty Dumpty was calling out for people to come onto the stage. <laughs> and he looked down and I'd gone and I was up on the stage immediately. And... I think I was the youngest there by far and he was going down the line teaching everyone a little dance routine mm -hmm. and when he got to me I refused to learn his dance routine and made him learn my dance routine. Wow at age and, three? Uh, at three yeah so and then this, everyone um so this apparently whole... I, I then I announced I was going to be an actor from then so yeah. So was, was this an early flash of Emma Grundyitis basically? <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Maybe. Do you think it's something Emma would have done? I don't know if it's, I guess then, yeah, maybe. God, maybe. Maybe we're really, really similar. I never knew. So, but that, that is remarkable that from such an early age, age of three, yeah. you know, you basically knew your path. Yeah, I always, I always knew that's what I was meant to do. It was weird. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. Yeah. No, I'm so grateful that I'm, I'm doing it. So Humpty Dumpty set you on the path. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you come out of school. Uh, what did you do uh, when you left school? So I took um, a couple of years after uh, finishing sixth form and then I went to drama school. I went to the mm -hmm. Bristol Vic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how did you find that? Were you, cause, cause like some people, um, when they go to drama school can find themselves a little bit intimidated. Some people are like, well, I, I went with two or three people who I actually knew. So I was like a duck to water. How was it for you? I didn't know anyone. We had a very small year group. There were 12 of us in our, on the three year course, mm -hmm. um, and really intense. Um, I loved it and we're all, um, I'm rubbish at keeping in touch with people, but I know that we're all, you know, linked forever. Um, I really loved it. It was so intense from the beginning. It's like 11, 12 hour days, um, sort of getting you as fitter than you've ever been in your life, which is brilliant and really hard. Um, what? But I, no, I didn't, I didn't know anyone going. So it was, it was very different. They were from all over the UK. It was really mm -hmm. cool. Just, I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant on most things and whatever. And I, 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 you know what, I, I, uh, 
I, I saw Mark Fluff when it comes to the archers. So I know nothing about nothing. Why do you have to oh, be yeah. fit? Why do you have to be fit to be an actor? Um, I guess because, I mean, going into, so the Bristol Old Vic is the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School and, mm-hmm. and its kind of ethos is about preparing you for theatre because if you can do theatre, you can adapt those skills to any other medium. Um, and theatre, the rigours of like eight shows a week for however long, six weeks, three months, a year, if you're at the RSC, is is really full on. It's, mm-hmm. um, it feels like, uh, and, and actually, that's probably less demanding physically and mentally than, than filming a series where you're working 10, 12 hour days um, shooting. And, mm-hmm. and in that sort of mental preparedness state, I mean, it makes it sound so like, it's, it's not working as a doctor, is it, or a nurse? But it's um, but it it's full on mentally, and I think having that physical fitness helps you to be able to just snap and be ready. Mm. Um, that whole TV adage of "hurry up and wait" is really true. That you have to get there, be ready, full makeup, full costume for seven o'clock when they begin, and then <clears throat> you're not going to be called till three p.m. And so you're sitting in your trailer, like, what am I going to do? But uh, mm-hmm. being being physically fit and being is, I think it's. I think the main benefit for that is being mentally relaxed and ready because there's mm-hmm. so much uh, insecurity and so much sort of out of workness that being able to look after yourself physically and mentally is part of it. But I think really the, the, the purpose in the training is getting you ready for, for the rigours of physical kind of theatre. So apart from the adage, hurry up and wait, which is a beautiful yeah. one, and uh, the fact mm-hmm. that you have to be fit and the being fit helps you mentally yeah um what's the one thing you think you actually learned from being at the bristol old vic you know if you have to like take away like one one thing so here you are you're the old matriarch of ambry <laughs> right in uh, 60 years time yeah and, and a new actor new, new actor comes up to you <laughs> you know what pearl of wisdom are you going to well, I don't know for radio. I don't know. I think um, I think in terms of if I could pinpoint one thing I took from drama school, it would be acting with with more than just my head. I think mm-hmm. I went to drama school and I was very into words and Shakespeare and the sound of stuff and text. And I, I didn't really realize I had a body on stage like I would do, every, you know, so it's like realize in imbo- literally embodying stuff. I'm starting to sound really like. Oh, no up my own whatever but you know it's really uh <laughs> it's I don't really, I don't know it's a fine line isn't it between taking it seriously and really not being in the world of reality but mm. um but uh yeah I think acting with your realizing you've got a whole body and that you can act with everything is really mm. <laughs> that was the thing I really learned from drama school I don't know what I'd say to somebody coming up in in the arches please god when I'm you know when I'm well, no, they, they could be years. well, well I'm, I'm presuming that Yes, someone would ask you, um, you know, how does this actually work from an actor's point of view, um, doing a radio drama, a, mm. you know, a long form radio drama. But then also, I suppose they'd ask, you know, what is it to be um, a, a proper professional uh, actor, you know, um, personal wisdom that way. But let's hold fire on that just for okay. now. Right. Okay. So, so you do your thing uh, at Bristol, you kill it you're really good and you're like <laughs> I don't know where, where did you that. where did you see yourself <laughs> going was it did you say to yourself well it's Hollywood Hollywood or bust or did you want to you know act in the West End or what type of acting did you think uh, you were going to um you know land or aspire to I think I think I've always wanted to do everything and that's part of why I wanted to be an actor because I get so bored so quickly and mm. <clears throat> with acting you can do everything I remember thinking like oh, I'd love to be a teacher I'd love to be a lawyer I'd love to be a social worker and then thinking but I could pretend to be all those things it's like um but it is having that um that constant stimulation in loads of different areas I think is really um key and I really wanted to do everything um and and be busy in all areas Bristol Old Vic's quite um another thing in, it, in its kind of Another thing that makes it unique, I guess, is that they they really want to, well, maybe not unique. I'm sure a lot of drama schools do this, but but rather than um, 
wanting to create and pick out a few stars. They really want to train everybody to have a solid career across all media. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so I really kind of absorbed that as, a, as an ambition that they, they would constantly say it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You want to be working in every area your whole life. And that's, that's what I want to do. I, I did always have my eye on, <clears throat> on the radio drama. And as soon as I heard about the Carlton Hobbs competition, I was like, I want to go for that. Um, so I was always obsessed with radio. I was the only nine-year-old I knew that listened to Radio 4. Like, I, <laughs> I, I loved radio and talking on radio. I couldn't, I couldn't really, yeah, it was all, always Radio 4 that I, that I loved. So to be on Radio 4 was a real dream come true. Mm -hmm. And what the nine year old you, right? Mm. What did the nine year old you think of the Archers? What was the Archers to you back then? I loved the Archers then because it was um, a link I had with my granny, and mm -hmm. I lived with her on and off um, through like my teenage years and beyond. And uh, and she listened to every single episode she listened to it from from when it began until until the day she died and uh, was this your irish <laughs> granny or your well she's yes yeah, so my dad's my dad's mum mm -hmm. um who yeah so she she um yeah she was born in the uk but she she was irish of heritage yeah, yeah. so um she always listened to it papa teddy always uh who is my musician grandfather he uh listened to every single episode and didn't know a thing about it because it, it, the music would begin and he'd tune it out completely. <laughs> um, but me and her always, always listened and everything stopped for it. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it meant a lot to me as a nine year old. Yeah. <laughs> when I, when I spoke to, to Tim, he actually said mm. his family were dumpty click as well. He says, if you heard that music, <laughs> went, it's off, it's off. <laughs> he said, little did I know how uh, people thought this is going to be in, in my whole professional life. And, and so was I, I, I was totally dumpty. Really? When, when yeah. I discovered Radio 4 and uh, it, for me it was Teenage Rebellion. Okay. So growing up in Birmingham, working class ordinary west indian parents we just had local radio and pirate radio on pirate right, radio brilliant. to listen to, listen to reggae and stuff but in the morning before we went to school it was local independent radio yeah uh, and um and then at about 13 14 i said there's got to be more to life than just abba you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and i and i discovered radio 4 and it was a whole world where people talked about ideas and then there were these dramas yeah. in the afternoon and i remember just yeah. being transfixed by them but this whimsical music came on i thought no way and it always tricked you because there'd be a good comedy on just beforehand mm -hmm. all right and, and I just couldn't reach out. And I heard this music, I went, no, that, I, I'm, I'm out of this. And then all of a sudden, Kathy Perks was snogging. Oh, yeah. The, the policeman. And I went, hey, that, this stuff goes on in the arches. And I, so I always say that, you know, it's Kathy Perks that actually got, got me into, Amazing. into the arches. So I'm a big advocate for her to, you know, come out of hiding and to yeah. be. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Because with that, without her in the mid eighties, I, I wouldn't be a fan of the Archers. All right, so <laughs> less about me. Um, so nine year old you loved spoken, uh, loved you, you love words, and you said mm, before yeah. that um, <clears throat> you wanted to be a Shakespearean actor, and mm. it was kind of interesting. You've made this constant link through uh, talking to you, and he said that it was about you didn't realise that you had a body as an actor really, mm. and this was really about you. And I'm putting words in your mouth now, maybe uh, translating uh, the words and, and emoting in that kind of classic uh, way, as opposed to being a very physical actor and realizing mm. they can use your body. Mm. You go for this award. Tell us about potentially what this uh, award was. And I'm, I'm presuming that, that you aced it. And then this is, um, you know, this launches you on this uh, mm. kind of spoken actor uh, uh, career that you have. So. Um, tell us about that. You've got to set the place for us and, and the okay. time. Okay. Over to you. <laughs> so um, every drama school um, in, a in the conference of drama schools, I think it's about 12 different schools, put up uh, four candidates every year. 
for mm -hmm. this BBC award, um, <clears throat> which is called the Carlton Hobbs Radio Drama Bursary Award. Yeah. And, uh, and out of all these different candidates that get put up, uh, four are offered a contract with the BBC for five months um, on the radio drama company. So doing all the plays, all the readings, um, everything and anything really across across the radio network and it's just the best the best training and mm -hmm. you're paid for it so um i was so excited to to in my first year i was like yeah i want to do that and it's like well it's up to the up to the teachers in your mm -hmm. final year if you get put forward but really luckily enough i was put forward and um and so yeah did training at drama school and then went for it and I don't think I've ever been more nervous in my entire life um, going from Bristol to London and going to the BBC at the top of um, Regent Street in Langham Place mm -hmm. and um, sort of breaks my heart thinking about it now because it's all it's all weird and empty and the whole of Regent Street is all quiet and it's so weird it's such a weird mm -hmm. time um, <clears throat> but going there then um, I don't remember that much about the day because I was so nervous. Um, but you do a, you do prepared things. So you do um, uh, uh, monologues that you've prepared, duologues in your couple, and then you have sight reading as a four, as the four of you, where you do a scene and you decide how to do all the sound mm -hmm. effects and how to do, you know, coming into a room and approaching the mic. You sort of show if you've got, you know, mic technique and how comfy you are in that space. And, and how much of this was you <clears throat> learning on the spot, the techniques of voice over acting and how much of this was you go, you know, did you actually learn this actually from being in Bristol at the old old Vic? So we, we learned a lot at Bristol and we're very lucky to have a, a proper radio studio that we, mm -hmm. that we um, used. But I, I was really lucky as well that growing up, um, I had a really good friend, um, Nick Warburton, uh, who's a writer and a kind of Radio 4 darling, writes wonderful plays. And um, they had, uh, when it was, uh, before it was BBC 4 Extra, they had um, a Nick Warburton season where they would play his plays every night. And uh, mm -hmm. some of his plays are just stunning, stunning plays. And so I'd been, before I went to drama school, I went and observed how one was made. So I sort of felt a bit at home in a radio studio. And, um, and I guess he picked up how much I loved words and audio and um, <clears throat> voice acting really and radio mm -hmm. drama. So, so I had a bit of a, um, not an in because he, he was nothing to do with the process, but, um, but I'd gone and, and observed a radio drama being made um, because I'd known him. I was like a little fly on the wall, which was really cool. And I just knew that when I went and, and did that before I went to drama school, I was like, that's where I want to be. I want to be doing that. Um, so, yeah, so I'd seen a bit of how it worked anyway. And then we had, we had training and we learned mic technique and all that kind of thing. Um, and we had one of our teachers is, is Lillian. We had a uh, son, oh, wow. Sunny. Um, and I didn't realize that she played Lillian. And then she wasn't there one day for one of our lessons. And, uh, and they said, oh, she's doing The Archers. And I said, oh, is she a director of The Archers? And they said, no, she plays Lillian. And I nearly fell on the floor because she <laughs> sounds really similar, but I'd never really put it together that this, because she doesn't look anything like the character in my mind, but that's everyone. That's everyone in the cast. <laughs> it really is. It like, really is. Um, when, uh, it'd be somewhat tried to me to say, say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Yeah. Logged on to Skype, I thought, that's not Emma Grundy. I know I look so wrong, <laughs> so wrong. I had you seen your to... picture before, but <laughs> you um, do have to forget what I look like. I look so wrong. So, um, how do you <laughs> how do you know? How do they tell you that you've been successful? And... I had a phone call. Uh huh. Yeah. So I had a wow. phone call from them, and I think I'm trying to think when we. I can't remember because it was so, I was so nervous. It was I think we did it on the Monday or the Tuesday, and I had a call on the Friday, um, and it was from them. And I've honestly, it was like dream come true. I couldn't believe it. So we finished our third who, year. Who did you tell first? I I think I texted my dad and called my granny. <laughs> yeah, it was so cool. It was so cool. 
and there were two of us at drama school that that both got a contract so mm -hmm. i looked over having had this phone call i looked over and my friend piers wayner was going <laughs> he also had a call <laughs> it was really cool yeah. so i then take it then you did lots of radio drama yeah tons, for yeah. radio four radio three etc yeah um and then where, and where were you living at the time? Did, did you have then have to move to London and all of a sudden have a glamorous actor's lifestyle? You know, you're hanging out, having cocktails, you know, <laughs> with, with all these famous yeah. actors. Are you part of the kind of acting um, jet set, I take it? Oh, I don't know if I'm part of an act, acting jet set, but I, I moved back to Cambridge, actually, after drama mm -hmm. school. So I was sort of commuting through those five months, but I had cousins that lived in London at the time. So I lived with them sometimes and sort of and lived in Cambridge officially and, and well, lived there and then would stay with my cousins. Yeah, just do a lot of that. So the, <clears throat> uh, so the kind of drama powers that be at the Beeb are like, okay, let's put her through a test, put her through her paces. Sorry about that. Noises off. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so they put you through your, your paces and obviously um, you did ridiculously well. Um, I you, skating over that. Listen, the pinnacle of your career is you speaking to me via Zoom now, I'm sure. So you've done fantastically well. Fantastically That's true. Well. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> when, do you, when did you hear about the Archers? Were you, did you hear that you're in contention, or was it a case of, ah, oh, we want you for the Archers? How does that? Happen? I had a call from mm -hmm. Julie Beckett, um, who was an exec producer at the time, and uh, she phoned me and said, this is a top secret call. Um, we're thinking of recasting a character. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to send you a couple of omnibuses. And uh, if you can mimic and play her, you know, we'd love to consider you for the role. <clears throat> Do you think you can mimic Emma? And I was like, because I hated Emma at the time. I was really praying that she was going to say Helen. <laughs> so I love the character <laughs> of Helen. Helen was my Kathy Perks. She brought me into the, into uh -huh. the world, being a proper fan on my own. Um, and Louisa, who plays her, is one of my best friends. And I would hate to replace her in the show. So I'm really glad they weren't replacing Louisa. But, um, but Felicity Jones, who played Emma, was just rocketed movie star. So... Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know any of that at the time, but I just said, yes, of course, I can mimic well enough, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they sent me these omnibuses and I, I've always been quite technical in, um, and I guess quite obsessive in, in prep, prep, preparation for stuff. And so uh, I wrote out all of how she wrote, how she spoke phonetically and, uh, and would just listen to these omnibuses on repeat, total repeat. Um, mm -hmm for two weeks and it was when I, I was coming to the end of the contract so mm -hmm. then Julie came to London and recorded me uh doing the, the scenes they sent me describe technically how she speaks for us well so Julie and I talked about this and um Felicity who created Emma, Emma so beautifully um used Susan as her kind of cornerstone Mm -hmm. um, which she would because she is absolutely her mother's daughter um, <clears throat> and so she Felicity grew up in Birmingham as well I think yeah so um, so and obviously Charlotte's a good Birmingham woman as well mm -hmm. um, so Emma is Birmingham rural I would say um, but but based on Susan she's got that breathiness that comes through but she's quite rooted in her voice and uh and yeah that kind of that birmingham sound that's also the countryside which is which is susan she's just such a fab i mean can you be a better character's daughter like it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> the, the the character of, of emma is also mm. Um, a good niece now because one of the things which is she's lovely, a brilliant is, niece <laughs> is the virgin relationship with you and your aunt it, it's great I know but isn't Tracy incredible the Horobins are great characters they absolutely Tracy are is absolutely fantastic they Susie absolutely are. Tracy is and just phenomenal <clears throat> I, you know I'm, I'm not just saying this but um, very obviously Tracy has become a total fan favorite and I've said mm, to Susie on more than one occasion like you've 
played and acted your way into this role because Tracy was a disposable occasional character yeah. at best. And actually she was a silent for, for, for a time, you know? She was. So the fact that Susie, you know, and we're I'm very proud that our, the, our Dum De Dummers, you know, she was our actor of the year last year. And yeah, she, she was, well deserved. She, you know, she'd been brilliant. <clears throat> but you, there you go, I've been such a fan. Emma, sorry okay that's fine <laughs> has gone on such an amazing kind of character journey yeah that yeah. um this has got to be a testament not only to the writing but to the acting that you've been able to to carry that kind of heavy load you know i i don't really remember the character of emma i know you weren't playing her then but before she got with will i don't really remember her mm. i don't mm. Um, and then the character of Emma is with Will, then with Ed, and oh. he has been this character who just wants to divest herself of all the bad luck of, yeah. um, of the Carters, forward slash Grundies, and mm -hmm. wants to <clears throat> aspire and wants to, you know, just have a, a regular home just like everybody mm -hmm. else. And you you know, she's working three jobs and you're down the chicken factory mm. and whatever. Mm. And and as part of uh, her great master plan to um as social climbing, you know, she'd become a counsellor, etc. Um and this is in large part you that you've taken us the listeners on this journey. So props to you, Mrs. First Aww. off. Right. Oh, bless you. Because Everybody, <clears throat> and, the, and you know, the great thing is also about her is she's not like everybody loves Lillian. Every every fan yeah, of the show loves Lillian. Of course, you know uh, she's the the she's the the aunt that you want to have a G and T with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, everybody uh, loves Tracy. The great yeah. thing is about Emma. Not everybody necessarily likes Emma, no, but she's right. a compelling character. Everybody ah, okay. wants to listen to her. Ah, that's good to hear. That's yeah. really good to hear. You know, it's not 100% love, but it's a case of, all oh, that, that, you know, that Emma <laughs> Grundy's on, on mic now. I'm going <laughs> to have a listen. <laughs> all right. So, all right. The whole point of this is your first day on set. So you've got, yeah. so you get the magic telephone call. Yeah. You and Piers are like, whoop, whoop. You know, yeah. we, we, we've got, we've got uh, these uh, contracts. Um, you're in London. You're having cocktails down at Soho House. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I don't know about that bit. We had, we had uh, jelly and, and tea in the, in the canteen. That was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> BBC uh, jelly is the best. <laughs> well, but funny you should say that. When I, was, um, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Ah. And my big uh, switcheroo career-wise was the BBC came to my school and uh, they, it's Keith Chegwin and he did a BBC TV, uh, BBC uh, educational show, sorry, mm -hmm. and uh, called Closed Talk, which no one ever remembers because it came on at like six o'clock in the morning. And the whole point was these brummy kids I've got 30 pounds, how long ago this was, as the mid eighties, 30 pounds to spend on an outfit to go to a wedding. Oh. And because I wanted to be a fashion designer, <laughs> I made my outfit. Oh. And they came, came and filmed us, took us down to television center. And you talking about BBC jelly, mm. I was sat in television center, <laughs> Michael Burke was opposite me on the same table, eating apple pie and custard and I go. went, I went, screw fashion. <laughs> it's all about media. And I just like, I was like, Michael Burke is in front of me. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, so BBC lovely. desserts, you know. It's all about the BBC desserts. They change careers. They change yes. careers. They all do. Right. So, um, <laughs> so it's your first day. Um, did you travel up on the train? How did you get to Birmingham? I think I went on the train, yes. Mm. And I would have gone from Cambridge. So I think I took a, I think there's, there's two ways of getting to Birmingham from Cambridge. There's a direct train, mm -hmm. which takes 
three hours, a little bit longer. And then there's the into London and out again, which actually is two and a half hours once you've done all the factoring and walking and changing trains. Mm. Um, but I think I took the direct train and it goes like that around the country. So you go to, you go over to Peterborough and then you go to all up to, to Birmingham across. Mm. Um, and so I was, I had marked up my script with exactly the sounds that Felicity made when she was speaking on every, you know, I've heard her say, Oh, like that. And I've heard her say what like that. And hello, you know, and uh, my first scene was with, um, Helen Monks, who used to play Pip Archer. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just so nervous. And I knew that I was in an episode with uh, Linda Snell, who was like my absolute love her, hate her character. And again, another really compelling, I mean, mm. you just want to hear everything. And actually, she's just love her, love her, love her now. She's the most amazing character. So I was, I was super nervous to meet her. And uh, and everyone really, everyone in the in the show. I was just such a fan, and I was really worried about replacing a character and how that would be <clears throat> seen, and if that would, if I'd be welcomed as the new Emma, or if you know, I just had no idea about what to expect. I was mm -hmm. so nervous. I prepared like everything to death because I was uh -huh. just, yeah, I couldn't couldn't were bear you, the idea of being underprepared. Were you uh, a one take Willie, just like bang, nailed it? Mm. I don't think. Well, I mean, I or I can't remember what happened with the recording. I'm sure I was not. I think Julie Beckett was directing, mm -hmm. and she was very kind and really lovely. And um, yeah, I think the feedback was positive, but I was just so like. But it was the weirdest thing. The the best bit of the whole day, and the bit that I really remember was walking into the green room and seeing just a circle of, of actors sitting and thinking, I don't know anyone. And then everyone speaking and I recognized everyone's voices. It was so weird. Everyone looked wrong. Everyone looked wrong, but they all sounded right. Who looked <laughs> least wrong? Great question. Um, least wrong. I don't know. I don't think anybody, I guess Tim looks least wrong, I think. I was going to say exactly that. You know, because everyone else is like, like Carol, who plays Linda, mm -hmm. is so like poised and uh, elegant and, and she has a much lower, like it's her voice, but it's lower and, and very, and she's really put together and beautiful and she doesn't try hard at all. She just is really cool and elegant. And you just feel like Linda tries a bit harder. You know, she's not <laughs> quite as cool, elegant. And, uh, but I, and I guess the most wrong looking person is, um, well, at that point was Roz who played Clary mm -hmm. um, uh, because she's tiny and really slight and has this long dark hair. I was like, I mean, Clary's this big, um, ruddy yeah. cheeked, like proper farmer's wife, you know, like from pictures books. And so, your yeah. mom, um, <laughs> oh, Charlotte, she doesn't Charlotte. like she's, she's all the glam. next the most wrong. Yes, she's so glam. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's got this whole other life. She's a superwoman. She's a proper superhero. Absolutely. Yeah. Like uh, you don't know what the hell's going going on with her and stuff. Like yeah, you know, all the clever <laughs> heads that she does. And then, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, I'm in awe of her. Yeah. Well, the character of Emma now is somewhat in a mother's shadow and is a mother's yeah. daughter, but aspires Absolutely. to be just a little bit more as well, doesn't she? I think, yeah, I think like any mother and daughter, I think she sees the ridiculousness of her mum mm -hmm. and especially daughters of mums who are really ambitious and who have come, like when you look at Susan's, character arc she's come from such a tough family and she's so like left that behind and that perfect house and everything and it's little you know you just know all the carpets are really thick and really like <laughs> they've always got <laughs> vanish in them and you know everything's so spick and span and well cared mm. for and uh and her you, you know you can't um it's really easy to laugh at her and I think that's what daughters do with their mums. But 
she's really gone through such a such a tough transformation and I think Emma's similar Emma's gone through a, a very tough journey um totally of her own making um and she's so much more Susan than I think she would ever want to admit um I think there's flashes of awareness with Emma of like is that what I'm like now tuck that away and she she just can't you know can't look at that but uh she's certainly ambitious and she's certainly a social climber I don't know how um <clears throat> how conscious that is I think that's completely subconscious for Emma she just wants the best for her and her family I don't mm. think she realizes that you know quite all the ways that she goes about it <laughs> So let's put Emma to one side and let's end with Emerald. Um, when you get the call from Hollywood, you know, Kevin <laughs> Feige basically says we've got this great new female superhero character and we want you to play her, right? You're not going to ditch Ambridge, are you? Never. I will never ditch Ambridge. Films get shot in six weeks. You might be on for a week or two. Or, I mean, but the classic answer is, uh, is Tamsin Gregg who's got this extraordinary career. She's, you know, killing it everywhere and comes back and, and, uh, and is just fabulous in the arches. I really, really, I am so attached to the arches and to Ambridge. Okay, All right. So I think Dumdy Dumbers here have got a scoop. We've got an exclusive, right? Whatever, <laughs> oh God, we're what never said. gonna leave. Right? So, so Kevin Feige, <laughs> yes, he'll do his movies, but you'll always I'll have, absolutely do. You no, know, Ambridge always comes first. The Archers always comes first. However, exactly. I will be your Marvel uh, superhero. Um, East I'll Enders, do it because, you know, Hurry, none of that's gonna get in the way. Big money. Oh my God, nothing gets in the Amazon, way. Amazon, Amazon, come to you or Netflix, right? And they go right. Here is. Two million quid, three season contract, right? Fab. Right. You write, <laughs> you direct, right? And you're gonna go, yeah, but Ambridge still comes. We'll just work around the blocks. Yeah. Work around the like Am that. Uh, Ambridge blocks. Well, Dum Dum exclusive. Emerald <laughs> is going nowhere. <laughs> Listen, thank you for coming on. Thank and you. Being, um, Such a pleasure. Listen, technically. You're actually our fourth uh, actor to come on to my first nice. day on set, but I lost Michael's recording. I was like, I know. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Like, I, I, I had to sheepishly, and like, we had such a lovely chat as well. Oh. Right. You know, I'm like, you know, Alistair's coming into his own, you know, mm. got rid of Shul and now you're blossoming. He says, I know. That's it. Look at it. It's wonderful and whatever. It's gorgeous. And we had the best chat. Can I find that recording? You know, I think I did some spring cleaning on my laptop because it's forever running out of space, right? And I thought I moved it onto my hard drive and I didn't. So Whoa. tail in between my legs. I says, dude, can we do this again? And he went, after the Coronas. Yeah, Royfield, you know, yeah, after the Coronas or whatever, we're going to do it again. So you're the Good, third so one. Do it again. But really you're the third <laughs> But actually, you've been the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you enjoyed watching, then you can subscribe to this channel by clicking the button. That means you won't miss any more updates on what's going on. And you can also listen to Lucy Royfield and other The Archers listeners on Dumpty Dum, the weekly podcast. Don't tell anyone I said anything though, will you?